Palmer's Picks, Tom Palmer Jr. brings us a look at the hysteria of the EC horror and crime comics of the 1950s. Subject matter that's near and dear to my heart, man. I'm a big fan of VC Comics. I was thinking of this on the reread. This may have been my first insight into EC Comics and this piece of history. That blows my mind, man, because, uh, you know, around this time, Tales from the Crypt TV show was out. Russ Cochran does have newsstand distribution for Tales from the Crypt comics, Haunt of Fear comics, and they're kind of uh, published in these 64-page uh, pamphlets that come sort of ganged up in the back. There's an issue of, like, uh, say, Weird Fantasy or Weird Science Science would be uh, included. So I, I was able to read those comics from a very young age and, and, and uh, experience those comics the same way that a kid in 1953 would have experienced those comics. And let me know, let me, let me tell you, they stuck with me. I bet. This is a great article because it traces the history of EC Comics. So EC Comics, you know, at this point, 30 years uh, past the Comics Code, 35 years past the Comics Code, they're kind of this, I don't want to say a footnote, they're a big historical marker in the past of comics, but the way they exist now is in his, history books and in reprints. So this gives you the be- background, which starts with uh, the publisher of EC Comics, Bill Gaines, his father, Max, basically invents the comic book format. He does. He gets some uh, Sunday newspaper comics, binds them together, and gives them some kind of a premium giveaway, some product, and they catch on. People love them. And and slowly but surely, they start showing up on uh, New York City newsstands, and it proliferates from there. And his dad is looking for a you know redeeming qualities, right? He's doing Bible stories and, and things that uh, parents would be happy to give their kids, the kids might not be interested in them, but... The E in Max Gaines' EC Comics stood for educational. <laughs> and then in uh, in true EC fashion, as I like to imagine... Now, Max Gaines, he died. And what they say is a boating accident. And it's never elaborated on more than that in anything you read. Personally... I like to think that it was an EC style, like outboard motor, fucking chopped his head off or something like that, but he probably just drowned. It could have been an EC crime style because at the time of his death, he was $100,000 in debt. Interesting. And the, and the company lands on, in the lap of young William Gaines, who wasn't looking forward to that whatsoever and felt an, an insane responsibility to his dad, to the family, gets a hold of... EC Comics, Educational Comics, and he starts making some changes. Some of the early changes he starts making is is pushing the the, the line into um, romance comics. In the back of those uh, A Moon, A Girl romance comics, they would be um, formatted s- similarly to the popular EC Comics. Four stories drawn by four guys, seven to six to seven pages apiece. And he just tries on a whim to include a horror story in the back of one of those uh, issues. He gave he gave the uh, he gave the strip a host who would turn out to be Crypt Keeper. The rest is history, as they say. Yeah, so those books take off big time. He starts gaining momentum, a lot of letters start coming in, and EC begins publishing the horror line of books, Haunt of Fear. Vault of Horror, and the one that everybody will know is the Tales from the Crypt series of comic books. If you don't know the comics, you you may have known the, the HBO TV show. Um, the HBO TV show wouldn't just pull story material from uh, the horror books. They also pulled uh, material from uh, the crime books, the suspense stories that they put out now these are starting to pile up and we're gonna <laughs> have to get out of focus yeah. <laughs> <laughs> crime suspense stories look at that classic cover and well that's not that much of a classic cover crime suspense stories shock suspense stories two other big hits for ec comics but this isn't the kind of thing that bill Gaines and his his editor al Feld, feldstein were most passionate about they were a part of science fiction fandom in the early days um, it's on record that Bill Gaines was like an insane insomniac, would be up for days. He's on, you know, barbiturates and, and, and speed and all that, which did not help when he was on his, you know, Senate subcommittee hearing, which we will be talking about in a couple minutes. They liked science fiction. So they published two science fiction titles that didn't sell for almost anything, but he had the keys to the castle. 
they were making money, uh, there were going to be science fiction books. Weird science and weird science fantasy were a part of were a part of that uh, new direction, as it was called. Now, t- now, Tales from the Crypt is probably one of the most popular uh, vestiges of EC Comics, but the one that has endured over time, that's been coming out on a very regular basis, monthly, basically since it became a magazine. Mad started out as a comic book, a very successful comic. Uh, you know, we use the, the word viral now. Uh, it's a trendy term. So imagine that each of the comics that we just showed you are posts on Instagram, and you get 10 to 15 likes per, per post. But then you put something out there that gets, say, 10,000 likes, that will be Mad Magazine. Yeah, and one thing about Mad Magazine that struck me as we were preparing for this is it's, it really is fan fiction. You know, because they're parroting popular culture trends, movies, other books, you know, all of these different things that are happening in the world around them. I don't think you can do it unless you have a real sincere love of that, whether it's the genre that you're lampooning, the structure that's built on, or the characters themselves. Um, that really came through to me going through these comics again, is just like, that is a bunch of people that love the source material, even if they maybe don't want to admit that in, in, uh, in, in all the company around them. Harvey Kurtzman was the editor of the Mad Comic, and uh, for my taste, I judge a cartoonist by which, uh, which you know, Russ Cochran, uh, EC, hardcover book sets they have. So you have to have the Harvey Kurtzman edited line. You have to have the Mad, but the, the war books that EC Comics put out, Frontline Combat, and before that was Two-Fisted Tales, some of the most sort of, I don't want to say realistic, but human they didn't portray all of these guys like gi joe do-gooders killing the enemy these are tragic stories yeah it was a different version of war you know and it was the flip side of the satire that you would see in mad magazine was the depiction of the enemy as human or the soldier as flawed or scared or struggling in this in, in you know in their war theater it was a very different um probably charged with an- anti-patriotic at the time in some cases certainly in these 1950s when these books were coming out man if you weren't with us you must be a commie very challenging material for the time period and the reason that it still exists and is still you know talked about and reprinted and and shown 60 years later now so when mad comes out it's it's tremendously popular and within months there were parodies of of mad comics out there poof and booger and any, <laughs> think of anything you can think one of one word disgusting weirdo <laughs> titles so ec ad- admittedly decided to make their own uh imitation mad comic yeah true publisher you have to jump on the popular trend even if you started it good thing they did in a way too because harvey kurtzman only stuck around uh with ec and mad for about 24 25 issues and al feldstein picked up the slack on the editorial duties of mad magazine and feldstein was the editor for panic so he got some practice in that's a great cover it is a good one <laughs> seemed to arouse a lot of uh, public outcry these comics are becoming more and more popular in those 1950s usurping funny animal comics and uh you know sophomoric child fare yeah and the key if you're doing crime and horror if you want to be more popular you've got to outdo the next guy and so those crimes and that horror depiction gets more and more graphic and lurid and Basically, all the qualities that you think make those comics successful, you're going to accelerate. <laughs> accelerate they did. And, you know, things, a lot, of, a lot of gore started showing up on covers. And that probably is what caught the parents' attention. They weren't, wor- they weren't looking inside the books, man. But they're seeing right next to the Donald Duck comics that were on the racks. They're, they're seeing a guy holding a woman's head. You don't see her neck. But you see a bloody axe and you see a body over yonder. And that was actually the specific uh, that was actually the specific comic that was brought up when the comics people were called in front in front of uh, the Senate subcommittee hearings after Dr. Frederick Wortham started to pound the pavement and talk about juvenile delinquency and how comics is contributing to juvenile delinquency. This is before the Beatles and Elvis were out. This is before the Doom video game. So they needed to point the finger at something for why their kids were being little hellions. 
Yeah, and comic books would have been the, uh, the, 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 the front of youth culture. The very early stages of development, as you say, before the Beatles and rock and roll, before television had really gained hold, comic books were the youth culture of that time period. So when juvenile delinquency became a, an issue, Frederick Wortham makes, uh, makes a name for himself with his book, Seduction of the Innocent. We had a copy of Seduction of the Innocent in the Homestead Library when I was a little kid, man. Like, it is extremely rare on Amazon. It's probably going for hundreds of dollars. Like, it's never been reprinted or anything like that. There became a very strong anti-comics movement amongst parents, politicians. Uh, you know, it was pretty widespread. There wasn't a lot to, to get that ire. Whenever your kids were, when things were going wrong, comic books were it. You know, there wasn't a lot you could aim at. I have, a, I have a small transcript from the uh, Senate subcommittee hearings where uh, Bill Gaines was, uh, he was there, he was on speed to try to keep his weight down, and he didn't do himself any favors. Can I read a little Please. bit of the transcript? They're called the, uh, the, the Kefauver hearings, I guess. K-E-F-A-U-V-E-R. How would you say that? Kefauver? Yeah, that sounds right. Here's your May 20... 20- May 22nd issue. That It might actually be issue 22. This seems to be a man with a bloody axe holding a woman's head up, which has been severed from her body. Do you think this is in good taste? Should one of us read the, the cross-examination here, you, in one Here, read? you could be Gaines. <laughs> yes, sir. I do for the cover of a horror comic. A cover in bad taste, for example, might be defined as holding the head a little higher so that the neck could be seen dripping blood from it and moving the body over a little further so that the neck of the body could be seen to be bloody. But, sir... You have blood coming out of her mouth. A little. Here is blood on the axe. I think most adults would be shocked by that. Didn't go good for him after that. And uh, instead of allow, instead of waiting for the government to take control of the situation, the the territory leaders of uh, of the wrestling promotions, uh, the, <laughs> <laughs> the NWA of the time, <laughs> yeah, the NWA of comics. Decides to get together, Jack Leibowitz and those guys, and uh, Martin Goodman, and all these guys get into a room, and they decide that they're going to self-police. They're going to come up with this thing, which ultimately ends up being the Comics Code Authority, and they're going to um, they're going to decide on on sort of laws and mandates of what is acceptable and what isn't. And guess what, Jim? What Ed? <laughs> Almost every word that was on the title of an EC comic was banned from publication, banned from receiving the, the, the gold star of the Comics Code Authority, which meant that the comic was then not picked up for major distribution. Yeah, this effectively puts EC's New Direction line out of business. So if you're a publisher and you have some very popular comics, how do you circumvent this? When all the other publishers are against you, Jim, what did Bill Gaines decide to do? First, he tried a very tepid line of comics that didn't work. Yeah, piracy. How could you not see a comic like Psychoanalysis hitting with the public? <laughs> Literally talking heads. <laughs> yeah, so he, he switches mad to magazine format to get outside of the comic book code authority. That's hacker culture. That's, circum that's circumventing the system, man. And that is punk rock as hell, and I salute the guy, man. Not only does he turn Mad into a magazine, but it becomes even more successful that way because comics was such a, such a dirt medium to adults, to the wider public, that they wouldn't dare allow themselves to be seen reading a comic book, but a square-shaped uh, magazine, perfectly acceptable. That 3x4 ratio is just better than the 2x3 ratio. Come on, Ed. <laughs> Heck of an article... I have no more notes for the main body. Tom Palmer uh, gives us some recommended reading for, for further insight and analysis of the, of the entire situation. Book number one, From R to Zap. Harvey Kurtzman, Visual History of Comics. I only recently got this book, and I love it. I highly recommend it with the same fervor that Tom Palmer does. It's basically, it's basically just a, sort of a, detail, a visual history of comics... And the text that you're reading is, is, is Harvey Kurtzman just talking shop, talking about the, the material that he likes. Of course, this is a, a probably Lou Fine. Like, like all these guys loved uh, yeah. Lou Fine back in the day. Yeah, this, this looks like a great book. Reminds me a little bit of Jim Steranko's uh, History of Comics. You know, I've never seen it, but it, it goes very current, 
it goes more current than you would think. Yeah, I'm impressed you know, by that. Harvey, uh, Harvey Kurtzman talking about American flag and, and really Dark cool. Knight Returns. Like, you got to get your hands on this book if, if, if it's not a part of your library already. A uh, couple other books, Completely Mad. Um, Have you read Completely Mad? I never knew of its existence. Me either. I, I'll be, I was very unfamiliar with these recommended reading lists. I've never seen From Arc to Zap. So that's on my list now. But the completely mad, um, you know, history of mad sounds like something that would be fantastic. These all uh, sound interesting to me, man. The Mad World of William Gaines. Like, let me get some more detailed analysis on that guy because I just I just like him a lot. Yes. I think he's super cool. Um, my Life as a Cartoon is Harvey Kurtzman's autobiography. I never knew that he wrote an autobiography. Me either. Uh, I could highly recommend the Harvey Kurtzman biography done by Bill Shelley for Fantagraphics that recently came out. So I'll just add that little addendum to the piece. I would add the uh, Harvey Kurtzman art book that Dennis Kitchen Abrams. wrote or edited or something a couple of years ago that has reproductions of some of his like breakdowns for these stories, some of the war stories on, you know, like legal document, legal pads and stuff, little scribbles and pencil and seeing the progression. It's a really nice art book and, you know, fe features Harvey Kurtzman. Like, if you want to stare at some artwork for a while, you could do a lot worse. And uh, the complete history of Marvel Comics, five fabulous decades of the world's greatest comics. And I long ago lost my dust jacket. <laughs> For this article, Tom Palmer doesn't mention it, but uh, Harvey Kurtzman did work for, I guess it was probably Timely Comics back in the day. So the work is, hey, look. You're right. And this was what was known as a filler strip. These would be like one-page strips that was an ad wasn't sold, so at the last minute they just had to send the book to the printer and they needed something for this page. Nobody wanted these. This was considered the lowest of the low. And Kurtzman, I think, was doing other stuff around the office. Like, he wasn't a full-time cartoonist at this point, wanted to be. Um, and so they would give him these pages to fill, and he did this ongoing strip called Hey Look. And it has all these kind of, like, formal, you know, him playing with the page. What could you do on a page, essentially? And I, I love this strip, and it's been reprinted several times. You know, you can, you can get an inexpensive copy of this in reprint form. And I always think, like, this is the garbage that nobody wanted 50 years ago and it's still in print and whatever books these appeared in nobody remembers those books but they remember this piece this strip that no one else wanted and harvey kurtzman turned into gold and he was able to because this was such flotsam and jetsam to marty goodman he got to maintain uh control and he owned these strips my favorite uh hey look strip is uh, a guy wakes up and he's kind of he's kind of cranky he's tired he needs to wake up he needs some pep in his step and then his wife uh, pours him, pours him, you know, a cup of joe, and he he kicks back, he drinks it, and then he spits it out and says, "Oh, that was ink." <laughs> How great, right? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's breaking the fourth wall already, and this is 1949. Yeah, yeah, I love the idea that you know whatever opportunity you get, you're able to turn that into something. 